U.S. Payments Forum Connexus webinar, Accepting EMV Chip Payments at the Fuel Pump. My name is Kathy Medich, and I'm Associate Director for the U.S. Payments Forum. We're very excited to be offering this webinar and want to thank all of you for attending. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Connexus for partnering with us to make this event possible. Before we get started, I want to address some points about the webinar interface that you see on your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the question box in the GoToWebinar interface. You can submit a question at any time during the session. Questions will be collected so the presenters can respond to them during the Q&A portion of today's event. We ask that you please not ask questions related to cost, pricing, or specific vendor solutions, since we won't be able to answer those types of questions. Also, today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived and available from both the U.S. Payments Forum and the Connexus website. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. We have a great set of expert speakers for today's webinar. Following my brief introduction, we have Linda Toth, who is Director of Standards for Connexus, Brian Russell, who is EMV Lead Business Analyst for Verifone, and Kara Gunderson, POS Manager for Citgo Petroleum. Kara is also a co-chair for the U.S. Payments Forum Petro Working Committee. Next slide, please. During today's webinar, we'll be covering a broad set of topics. I'll give you a brief overview of the U.S. Payments Forum, and then Linda will provide an overview of Connexus. We'll then move on to provide an overview of the CSOR industry, a description of the EMV liability shift as it applies to the petroleum industry, an overview of EMV, focusing on how the technology is used at the pump, and a sample implementation plan for becoming EMV compliant. We'll end by summarizing EMV resources for the petroleum industry and then having the Q&A. Next slide, please. For those of you who don't know us, the U.S. Payments Forum was formerly the EMV Migration Forum. We were launched to support the introduction and implementation of EMV in the U.S. And last summer, we expanded our mission to include other new and emerging payment technologies that protect the security of, the, of payment transactions within the U.S. We have an active cross-industry member base and work on projects that need discussion and coordination across the payments ecosystem. Two of our working committees collaborated to produce this webinar, our Communications and Education Working Committee and our Petroleum Working Committee. The Petroleum Working Committee has been quite active in providing a forum for industry stakeholders to resolve challenges with EMV implementation in the U.S. petroleum and convenience market. I would also like to point out that we've published a wealth of resources for EMV implementation, including an EMV FAC for petroleum merchants, a white paper that provides details on the EMV fraud liability shift for all of the major payment networks, and a white paper on how to optimize the transaction time at the POS. With that, I'd like to turn the slides over to Linda Ta. Linda? Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. So, Connexus is a nonprofit technology organization. We're dedicated to the sea store and retail fuels industry. We are independent from NACS or the National Association of Convenience Stores, but we do work very closely with NACS as their technology arm. Connexus does a number of things, including um, setting standards for data exchange. Um, things like EB2B or POS back office. We also do payment standards, um, including we have a mobile standard that's uh, specific to our industry, but it does allow mobile payments for petroleum. We educate. Um, we do monthly webinars and white papers. We also advocate with other organizations. Um, we make sure that we steer the conversations towards what's good for our industry. We also take into account the concepts that we learn at some of these other organizations, and we incorporate those things in our standards to make sure that our in industry standards are world class. Um, we sit at the table to make sure that what's being done doesn't negatively impact our industry. Um, and Connexus makes sure that re regulators know our business realities, and EMV is no exception. Um, we are also a member um, driven organization by volunteers. We have volunteers like Kara Gunderson who runs the data security panel and Brian who runs the loyalty group. Um, and those those people, those volunteers and SMEs are the ones that do the heavy, heavy lifting for the organization. 
Next slide. So uh, the NAC show is a little bit less than a month away in Chicago. Um, if you're attending, this is a great opportunity to visit with your vendors to get more information about their specific EMV solutions and availability. It's also a great opportunity to visit with Connexus and our members. Um, we partner with NACs to bring you the technology edge or the tech edge. Um, this includes a whole bunch of good education sessions. Um, we also man the Technology Edge Solutions Center, which is in booth 4384. And here you'll have a chance to see some of the latest technology for retail, as well as get an opportunity to ask questions and get additional information about technical issues you're facing, including EMV. Next. So the uh, C-Store industry is quite large. Our vertical has a little over 154,000 sites, which is more than our three closest adjacent verticals combined. That would be supermarket, drugstore, and dollar stores. Um, and over 80% of our stores sell fuel and therefore are very interested in what's happening with EMV at the pump. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Brian, who's going to give us a little bit more overview of the C-Store industry. Thank you, Linda. Uh, I just wanted to dive in a little deeper to the, the petroleum vertical. As Linda mentioned, there are over 150,000 stores in that vertical, or most of which 124,000 of them sell fuel. Uh, 40 million people fill up their tank every day at these C stores, uh, and we do it four or five times a month. The C, our C stores do 160 million transactions a day, and if you think of that, the United States contains 320 million people, so uh, we run about half of half of uh, the number of people in the country uh, transactions every day. They sell an estimated 80% of, of gasoline to the tune of $316 billion uh, every year. And in all those sales, 72% of the consumers pay for fuel at the pump with the plastic. So that's, what, that's what's important here because that plastic is gonna become EMV very shortly. With all that size though, did you know that over 60% of those stores, that's almost 100,000 stores, are single chain operators, so they only have one store. Uh, another big chunk has less than 10 stores, so a, a very large percentage of our uh, store population is uh, small independent operators. You guys don't have any IT department, you don't have an EMV task force to tell you how to get ready for this stuff, but you definitely have a lot of questions about uh, EMV. So. While the following information we're getting ready to give uh, certainly applies to everybody implementing EV, what we try to do is focus on the, the smaller independent operator uh, to answer some of the questions that they may not have the resources to answer on their own. And the first of those is probably when. When do we have to do all this? So I'm gonna hand this back over to Linda and she's gonna talk about the EMV liability shift dates. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> so, um, you can go ahead and, yeah, there you go. Um, so the important thing to remember about the EMV liability shift is that it's not a mandate by the payment networks. There are financial and other impacts to your business if you don't upgrade to EMV, and we're certainly recommending that you do, but it's important to understand that it's not required by the payment networks. However, if you are a franchisee, they may be mandating EMV, so be sure to check with your oil brand about requirements. The specific dates that are relative to petroleum and convenience stores is October 1 of 2015. So almost two years ago, the indoor payment terminals went into effect, and that would include any uh, payment kiosks other than automated fuel dispensers. So that would be things like if you have a payment terminal on your outdoor car wash, that went into effect in 2015. The liability date for AFDs was originally 2017, we did get a three-year deferment on that to 2020, so that's the important date to keep in mind is October of 2020. So let's take a look at what the liability shift actually means. Next slide. Um, so very briefly, it means that it shifts to the party in the payment chain with the least secure payment technology. So for example, if a consumer presents a chip card at a mag stripe only terminal, the terminal is the least secure technology, so the owner of the terminal is going to be liable. If a consumer presents a mag stripe card at an EMV terminal, the card is the least secure technology, so in general, the issuer would still be liable. 
to understand exactly, next slide, to understand exactly who's liable, it really depends on a number of items. So first you have to consider the type of fraud. There's counterfeit card, and this is where you still have your card in your wallet, but somebody has taken your card information and has created an unauthorized duplicate card and is attempting to use it. There's also lost and stolen fraud, and this is when you don't physically have your card anymore. Somebody has gotten a hold of it and is attempting to use it. It's also important to take a look at the card type, whether it's magnetic stripe only or if it's chip enabled. You have to take into account the specific payment network, whether that be like Visa or MasterCard or any of the others, including debit networks. Um, you have to look at the location of where the transaction is taking place, meaning is it attended, uh, like a cashier is involved in the transaction, or is it unattended? And these are the outdoor payment kiosks. It could be a vending machine, your air hose, or the AFDs. Um, and then finally, you have to take a look at your system capabilities for both terminal and point of sale, meaning are they EMV capable? So next slide. Um, what this really boils down to is that until you have a PIN terminal capable of reading EMV chip cards and the associated software to process it, you as a merchant could be liable. Otherwise, you'll be protected. So bottom line, install EMV terminals with pin processing and get software that can process it. So with that said, we actually have a three-year deferment to 2020. However, effective on the original date, October 1 of 2017, which is coming up, there are some cases where you still might be on the hook financially if you experience a lot of fraud or chargebacks. And CAR is going to explain some of these um, conditions. Thanks, Linda. Yes, yeah, so several payment networks have chargeback threshold limitations, and that's relative to the three-year deferment or extension that we've received in the petroleum industry. And uh, make sure that you're checking with your payment processor, uh, the, the payment network or card brand or your oil brand for more specific information. But the limitations, meaning that, that you may experience EMV chargebacks earlier if you have excessive fraud to sales ratios and excessive amount of chargebacks, or it could be a combination of excessive fraud to sales ratios and the number of chargebacks. And as Linda said, this is all effective October 1st of 2017. Sometimes it can affect just the outdoor EMB counterfeit liability shift, meaning for the three-year deferment. Um, it could also apply, depending on the car brand or the payment network, uh, it, it could apply to indoor and outdoor, lost and stolen, EMV and non-EMV. And the effects of that and the repercussions could be that you have to instill and install additional fraud management processes. And as I mentioned a few seconds ago, that, that you could also incur EMV chargebacks prior to that October 1st of 2020 date because you, you reach some of those excessive uh, chargeback thresholds. You could also see additional penalties and fines imposed on top of the chargeback if you reach those thresholds. And then the timing, depending on where you land in that fraud to sales ratio, you could experience uh, immediate chargebacks or you could be offered a remediation period. And that again depends on the total volume of the chargebacks. And I would also note that the three-year extension only applies to US issued cards for some payment networks. And so therefore, if you have cards issued outside of the US, the, the three-year extension does not apply to those. So now I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and he's going to give us a little bit more of an overview on EMB. Thank you, Cara. What I'm going to try and do here is, is uh, just cover some high points of EMB and particularly point out some of the places uh, that are impacted specifically for outdoors and to explain maybe some of the choices you might hear bantered about and uh, discuss with your vendor. So to start off with, uh, what is EMV? So EMV is a, a global standard uh, for terminals and chip cards and devices, and it allows communication between that terminal and the chip on the card, which is a microprocessor, in order to process transactions. So the standard defines everything about EMV. It defines the, the physical placement of the contacts on the card. So you see that little blue square up there. 
every one of your EMV cards is going to have a contact that's in it, or contact set of contact terminals that's in exactly that same spot, and that's so that when you insert it into the terminal, the terminal knows how to power apply power to the chip. It knows how to set the clock rates. All kinds of things uh, are specified in that interface. So it specifies that, and it specifies how the uh, multiple applications work, the tag usage, and the values. And that standard is administered by EMVCO. So all the EMV cards contain a chip. And what that chip does primarily uh, in the functionality of EMV to make it uh, secure is performs cryptographic functions. And that part of the, the transaction that uh, is used to support the cryptographic functions is dynamic depending on the transaction. So that, So every time those cryptographic values are uh, generated, it makes it um, a very unique uh, set of numbers that the issuer can validate and that no other card would be able to generate. And that's what that's what makes uh, EMV secure in the sense of uh, fraudulent card use. EMV transactions can also work as contactless. You've probably seen some of these at, at uh, various stores already. If you look in the corner of the terminal at the bottom of the screen there, you can kind of see the a little contactless symbol there. Uh, if you see that on your terminal and on your card, there's a good chance that you can run a EMV contactless transaction there. And what that means is you just have to tap your card uh, and not actually insert it into the reader. It still does all the same cryptographic functions that the contact EMV uh, transaction does, but it makes for a faster experience for both the merchant and the consumer. So now that you know what EMV is, um, I think it's important to understand what it is not as well. So EMV is not a data encryption standard. Uh, the cardholder data that's read from the EMV chip is in the clear just as much as a mag stripe would be. So as a merchant, you still need to protect that cardholder data. Uh, in essence, the PCI rules that you live by today or, or live under today are still applicable even with EMV. So if you want to uh, have maximum security for that cardholder data, you still need to do point-to-point -point encryption or end-to-end -end encryption or some form of tokenization on top of EMV uh, in order to protect that cardholder data. So the big takeaway here is that the EMV standard itself does not define uh, encryption of the data of the card, but it does ensure that the card is not a counterfeit card. So with that being said, I thought I'd talk about a little, uh, a couple of EMV terms. So if you've ever entered into a conversation about EMV, you probably got snowed under by all of the terms, the AIDs, the CVNs, the TAGs, the L1s, L2s, ARQCs. Uh, what's all that stuff mean? So I thought I'd hit on some of the high points. So an AID, what that stands for is application identifier. And what that actually means is the application that is on the chip, that is on the card, uh, runs and performs a certain uh, number of, of functions. The most visible of what you'll see as a, as a merchant and a consumer is probably happening during the CVM processing, and I'll describe that in a minute, uh, and has to do with prompting or not for a PIN. So some applications on the card may prompt for a PIN, some applications may not. And that's the, that is the EMV application that is determining whether that happens or not. And that's depending on what AID has been selected to run on that card. You'll also hear talks about a kernel. So the kernel is a piece of software on the terminal. And that, um, in the Petro environment, is going to be running on the pin pad. Inside or outside, it's going to be running on the card reader device that's in the pump itself. And the kernel is a piece of software that actually talks to the chip. So the EMV Co specification uh, has a very specific a set of commands and ways uh, that the information is exchanged between the chip and the, the uh, piece of hardware, and the kernel is the software that implements that. And that uh, kernel is certified by EMVCO, and it's done with what's called an L2 certification, and that, that means that EMVCO has certified this particular implementation of the kernel that it talks to the chip properly according to the specifications. There's also an L1 certification. What that is, is it refers to the hardware. So every piece of hardware that reads an EMV card, whether it's a pin pad inside or whether it's a, a card acquisition device outside, 
and OPT, we call those, uh, has received also an L1 certification. And that means that it knows how to make contact with that the contacts on the card. It powers up the chip correctly. It sets the clock rate correctly. All those little uh, details that are required to make a, the transaction proceed correctly. That's an L1. There's also been something that's come into, I call it a slang use. They call it an L3. That's not an official term but that refers to the application end-to-end -end testing. So when you get your application that you install uh, at your store, the vendor that supplied it will have done end-to-end -end testing with your acquirer and the issuer of the card to ensure that everything works out correctly. And that's referred to uh, just in the industry has become common uh, as an L3 certification. We already talked a little bit about contact and contactless. Both are full EMV transactions uh, in the sense that they protect uh, or prevent the counterfeit fraud of the cards. Um, the next term you'll hear a lot is CVM. What that stands for is cardholder verification methods. There's four of them that are defined for EMV. There's an offline PIN, there's an online PIN, there's a signature, and there's no CVM. An offline PIN is a PIN that's actually stored on the card. Uh, so if it asks, if you get a PIN prompt and the card can validate that PIN. Uh, that's called an offline PIN validation. Uh, and that, that, that verifies that that card is yours. That's an additional level of uh, security uh, that EMV can implement to make sure that the card is not only genuine, but it, that it's yours. Uh, there's also an online PIN. I think most people are familiar with that. That's what uh, debit cards today use. There's a signature CVM. I think people are also familiar with that. Uh, and that uh, when you use a credit card, you have to sign in order to uh, prove your identity there. There's also a no CVM uh, possibility. Uh, so the EMV uh, AID can analyze the transaction and decide according to that application's rules that it doesn't need any uh, CVM, any cardholder verification in order to do this transaction. And it, just won't do anything at that point. So those are the four. Uh, there's also some new ones that have come around. Remember the, the uh, contact list, you can also use your mobile device. So some of those devices have you know, fingerprint, facial recognition, that type of stuff. Those are referred to as CDCVM or ODCVM. So on-device CVM, uh, that's what that stands for. And that's a, that's a CVM that's done on the the mobile device itself and can be used by EMV to confirm the cardholder. Uh, you'll also hear a talk about pin bypass. So what pin bypass means is that if uh, the AID, the EMV AID prompts for a pin, it is the consumer's option to either enter without entering any, without uh, entering a number or canceling to bypass that pin and let that transaction go on uh, without having a PIN. That can be used as an alternative to debit credit prompting. Some applications are coded that way. You enter a PIN, you get a debit transaction. You don't enter a PIN, you get a credit transaction. Or, or it can just be used if you don't know your PIN and the transaction can be sent to the issuer for them to decide if they're going to approve that transaction under those circumstances or not. I also wanted to point out a couple of uh, terms that have have been in common use in the petroleum industry for a long time, and those are fallback and offline. You need to be careful with those because in EMV, they have a slightly different meaning. Actually, they have a very different meaning. Fallback, when you mention it in EMV, means fallback to mag stripe. So if you're processing an EMV transaction, then for one reason or another, you're not able to read the chip or the terminal doesn't support uh, an AID that's on the card, you can get what's called a mag stripe fallback transaction. And that, that lets you still swipe the card, use the mag stripe on the card uh, to let your transaction go through. Whether that's going to be supported or not is up to the merchant, up to uh, your merchant agreement, probably with your uh, acquirer, and up to the issuer whether they're going to uh, support those kind of things. So a lot of people have a say in whether or not fallback is going to be allowed. Um, also, offline has a different meaning. Typically, that means that the host has been offline, and maybe your transaction is going to be approved locally. We call that stand-in as well, processing. But in EMV speak, offline simply means that the card has approved the transaction. So if your transaction is approved offline, that means we've sent the, 
the transaction to the card, told it all this information about the transaction, and the card says, oh, I can approve this without even going online. That's going to be rare in the United States because most of the cards have a $0 floor limit, so everything is going to go online. So those are just some of the terms you'll see. Hopefully that, that'll uh, help you understand uh, an EMV conversation. If it happens in the hallway, uh, you'll at least have an inkling of what they're talking about. So I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, types of EMV transactions. So uh, just like in MagStripe, they can support debit and credit transactions. Uh, and I'm speaking mostly in generalities here. There's probably some exceptions to this, but in, in general, a credit card, a pure credit card, is going to have a single AID, and that's going to be what we call the global AID from one of the four major brands, the Visa, Discover, uh, MasterCard, or Amex, uh, all have individual AIDs, and their applications perform as they've been programmed for those particular uh, networks. So they have a single AID. Uh, all CVMs are going to be possible, so inside you'll be able to do online PIN, offline PIN, signature, and no CVM. Outdoor, there's no signature, and if you think about that, that's for obvious reasons. There's no nothing outdoor uh, at the pump that allows you to sign anything, for one, and there's nobody out there to validate the signature. So uh, outdoor transactions are not going to have a signature CVM. That's one of the differences in the EMV configurations that we do. And today, uh, signature and or no CVM uh, currently predominates in the U.S. So very likely if you have a pure credit card, walk into a store, perform a small transaction, uh, it's going to have a signature CVM on it. If it's under a certain amount, it's going to qualify for the no signature limit uh, for whatever your uh, card network uh sponsors, and you may not even have to sign for anything. If it's a little larger amount, you're, you're likely to sign. That was present in MagStripe transactions as well. It continues in EMV. Not much change there. Uh, the, the big change has been in the debit side for EMV. So in the U.S., debit, U.S. issued debit cards from branded cards uh, are going to have two AIDs. And the reason for those two AIDs is to facilitate a uh, routing choice, and that routing choice was mandated that be given to the merchant by the Durban Agreement. You've probably heard of the Durban Agreement, and the gist of that says that the merchant must have a choice as to where his transactions are routed so that he can get the best price or, or the, uh, have competition to uh, process his transactions. So what that meant early on with those two AIDs and what the EMV Co spec says is that you have to put up a menu if there's two AIDs on the card. Um, over the course of a couple of years of EMV implementations and a lot of discussions at places like the U.S. Payment Forum, uh, for the most part today, especially in the petro industry and especially outside where we're well into the, the EMV rollout, um, you won't see those menus anymore. Almost everybody today, or all the acquirers today, recommend that if there's a common AID present on the card, that allows the, the um, acquirer to route that transaction in the most advantageous way to the merchant. So I'll talk about a couple of choices that are uh, possible with uh, EMV transactions. Uh, one of them is a fairly recent uh, occurrence from, the, from all of the uh, card payment networks, and that's the option of performing a quick chip transaction. So that's in um, in contrast to a EMV full flow transaction. And one of the things that happens in, or that that you'll see different in the EMV transaction is the card has to stay inserted into the reader for the entire authorization time of the transaction. What quick chip does is it allows you to insert the card, perform just the EMV. Uh, fraudulent card functionality and then remove the card right away so you don't have to wait for a final amount anymore which was one of the reasons the card had to stay in the reader and you don't have to wait for the host authentication anymore which was the reason that the card had to stay in the reader for the full transaction length so with those two restrictions removed uh, what the quick chip flow allows you to do is insert the card do the EMV functions and remove the card and then go through the transaction as um, normal. 
So very, very, very similar to a mag stripe transaction in that sense. Um, there's a couple of major uh, benefits to that besides just the decrease in transaction times, which uh, there is a decrease in transaction times. You can get consumers through, the, through your lines faster, so all that's a good thing. Uh, but the two biggies for the petro industry is that the, simp the testing and certification is greatly simplified with quick chip. Uh, the test cases are reduced by, I think, about a third. I may not be exactly uh, correct on that, but roughly a third to a quarter uh, of the test cases are removed for quick chip. And in the petro industry, where we're going to be doing a lot of certifications outside because of the number of kernels that we speak to outdoors, uh, that's a very, very big advantage for both the merchants and the vendors so that they can get their applications uh, out in the field uh, rapidly. In Petro, the other thing that it does is it lets you do loyalty processing exactly the same as you did it with MagStripe. If you think about um, what I described where the, the card has to stay in the reader for the whole transaction, what that did to loyalty was, was force loyalty to happen up front. Uh, with QuickChip, loyalty can again be processed after payment. So another advantage to Petro there. So speaking of loyalty, one of the questions I get a lot is how does EMV impact my loyalty? And the answer is, fortunately, uh, it really doesn't. So you're still going to be able to do uh, price per unit discounting. You're still going to be able to do ticket level discounting. Uh, I think most vendors will still be available or be possible to do loyalty processing prepayment. Uh, and many vendors, if they implement QuickChip, will probably be able to accept loyalty tokens after payment. So the good news there is loyalty is going to function pretty much as it did with MagStripe. So the next question I get a lot is about fleet. So there's several ways of handling fleet or a couple ways of handling fleet. Uh, currently, there's not a lot of fleet EMV cards in the market. They do exist, uh, but there's not a lot of them. And what the vendors are going to do initially will be supporting fleet uh, prompting and product restrictions from the track data that is returned on one of the EMV tags. Tag 57 has track 2 equivalent data, and we'll be looking at the prompt and product restriction data from there to process fleet. Uh, there is some work underway by the Connexus Group and the U.S. Payments Forum to create a standard for EMV fleet. Uh, that's underway. It's nearing completion. What that will allow us to do is process EMV fleet cards using tags from the EMV uh, data, and I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but what that really opens up for the petro industry is we'll now be able to encrypt track data without um, impairing our ability to look at the prompt and the product restriction data on the track because it's going to be an EMV tag. So kind of a double whammy there. We're going to have a standard to do fleet, and we're going to be able to do encryption of, of the track data. So a, a little bit of information about how uh, it's going to be uh, out, different outdoors uh, than indoors. We're still going to do two-part transactions. So those of you that are maybe a little bit more technical understand that in petroleum, we do an off advice set of transactions. When you do that, we off for a certain amount. Uh, we get a response back that enables us to fuel to whatever amount the uh, issuer has allowed, and then we complete that transaction with a financial advice with the actual amount that was fueled. Uh, the card does not have to stay in the reader all the way through fueling. That's another question I get a lot. You can do the authorization, remove the card, and then fuel. And I have an example of that you'll see in just a couple of minutes. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the card readers. Some of the card readers are going to clamp your card, and that clamp uh, ranges from light, where you can pull your card out, to it really grabs hold of that thing and you can't pull it out of there until the transaction is done. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, depending on the reader that you have outside, uh, they behave differently. Uh, in the U.S., we're still going to authorize for the maximum amount, so fill-ups are going to be uh, just as they are today. We're not going to have amounts of the fuel. Uh, like they do in Canada, you're not going to have to pick $10, $20, $50, whatever. Um, it's going to perform just like uh, MagStripe did today, or does today. Uh, I've talked about the no signature CVM outside, uh, or the fact that we won't have a signature CVM outside. 
Uh, there are, however, a lot of kernels outside, so that is going to complicate certifications for your vendors. That's one of the reasons for the deferment uh, in the liability ship was the, that complication. So you've heard about uh, what EMV is. You've heard about the liability shift. Uh, so I thought I'd show you a little bit about what it actually looks like when it happens. So I made two videos. I've discovered that I'm not Sp Steven Spielberg here, so you'll have to uh, excuse the, the amateurness of these videos. And they were shot from a development system here in our office, so uh, kind of ignore the, the actual text of the message. But what I'm going to show first is what happens when um, a card is removed too soon. So if somebody doesn't uh, know that there's an EMV uh, uh, terminal enabled yet, and they pull the card out like they would normally run an EMV, as you can see that person there did, you're going to get a message that says, hey, we've seen that this is a security chip, and you, and you have to leave your card in until prompted. So that's essentially what's going to happen uh, if you remove your card too soon. And I thought I'd show next what's going to happen if you uh, do the EMV transaction properly. So he's going to insert his card here. This particular card has an offline pin, so it's going to prompt for that pin. He's going to enter his pin. You're going to be able to see the card validate the pin if you watch real close here. Right there, pin OK. We're going to authorize that transaction with the host. And then he's going to remove his card. And the message will come up to remove the nozzle and start fueling. So that's what EMV is going to look out like outside. It's not a huge change from uh, MagStripe, but uh, now you've seen it. So you've heard about when the liability shift occurs. You've heard about what EMV is, and you've seen what it looks like. So I'm going to hand this back over to Linda, and she's going to talk about some of the advantages of being ready early. Thanks, Brian. So uh, yes. Um, Obviously, there are some potential benefits to upgrading early or as soon as possible. Um, you know, be aware of the fact that when you uh, upgrade to the next generation hardware and software that you're getting the latest and greatest. So by default or for a small add-on fee, you might get extra features or, or features that are integrated into the system. Um, if you do have to upgrade your communications, you may now have the ability to add media to your pumps. Um, you might consider contactless, which allows you to accept the pays. Um, you know, skimming continues to be a problem, and the next generation of dispenser hardware includes proactive ways to mitigate skimming, such as secure access with shutdown or POS alarms for unauthorized intrusion. Um, if you do upgrade early, you won't be fighting with your competitors for availability of equipment and technicians. Remember that you have to have qualified, certified technicians installing equipment and upgrades. The closer we get to 2020, the more in demand they're going to be. Um, you know, now's a good time to do an image refresh, whether that's simply, you know, you have new equipment and it's shiny and bright, or whether at the same time you do some kind of brand refresh. You know, you've got technicians on the site already. Now's a great time to do upgraded lighting or um, new signage. Make sure that you take the opportunity to grow and retain market share through positive customer perception. Consumers have these chip cards now, and they're looking at places to use them and will question places that can't accept them. And then remember, even if you don't lose customers, you may be a target for the fraudsters. You know, they're going to be looking for places to use cards, and so you don't want to be that target. And then remember that the longer it takes you to upgrade, the, the more exposure you have to excessive chargebacks um, and fees that Cara talked about that will go into effect in a couple of weeks. So with that, I'm going to give this to Cara, and she's going to walk through a sample implementation plan. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, so this is a this is a timeline for planning your automated fuel dispenser or AFD upgrades. So first, you want to determine availability of the point of sale software that supports outdoor EMV. Next, you're going to want to assess the fuel dispenser age and operability. You'll want to conduct site surveys at each of your locations because most of our sites are unique. You'll want to then place your order for upgraded fuel dispensers or your replacements. And then finally, you'll want to do the, the install of those fuel dispensers and the upgraded point of sale software. So let me break this down for you a little bit more. So first, to determine availability of your point of sale software for Audra EMV, you want to really check with your point of sale vendors, check with your oil brand, 
and um, and 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 find out exactly when that data is going to occur. Next, you'll want to assess your field dispenser age and operability because you need to decide whether you're going to replace the field dispenser or if you're going to use a retrofit kit or simply if you're just going to replace those secure pump pads, uh, secure pin pads. Typical rule of thumb, but not certainly set in stone, but if it's 10 years or older, your dispenser, the recommendation is to replace it. If it's zero to nine years old, you really need to assess whether you're going to replace it with a new field dispenser or you're going to use a retrofit kit. If it is a younger field dispenser, assess the operability. Is it working properly? Is it, is it dispensing properly? Are you having um, any sort of issues, pump flow issues? And again, consult with your automated field dispenser distributor or manufacturer to help you assess the, your needs. Next, you'll want to create a site survey for each site, because as I mentioned, each site is probably unique. And with EMB, more data requires more bandwidth, and therefore, you may need to assess the upgrade of communication lines. And then make sure that you're adding extra time if you're rewiring or repurposing your existing wire or you're having to break concrete. And of course, if you have to break concrete, that's an automatic EPA soil Sample, and then you may need to add extra time for soil contamination remediation. So I would note that if you're rewiring, you have the, you have the ability to do such things as taking your existing two-pair wire and converting them to TCPIP, or you could uh, rerun cable. And make sure that whatever you decide you're gonna do, that you separate your communication and your payments conduits from your electrical lines. And that is a very important uh, feature because of the fact that you could impact some communications and have some line noise from that electrical. So survey the site, again, with your automated field dispenser, distributor, or manufacturer, as each site will be unique. Next, you'll want to order your upgraded field dispensers. And what I mean by that is, is consider some of the options. As Linda said, you know, make sure that you can, you can gain additional market share. You may want to add video monitors to, to inspire in-store sales. 2D scanners in case you want to scan barcodes or QR codes at the dispenser. The field dispenser manufacturers have come up with some really great programs for tamper alarms to help you be more proactive against all those skimmers and folks trying to, to really uh, trying to hack into your field dispensers. And then lastly, strongly consider adding near field communications or NFC so you can accept payment types such as Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and Android Pay at the dispenser. And then lastly, you're going to want to go through the installation process and upgrade that point of sale software. So, and again, this is just an example of a time frame. Allow four to eight weeks from order to delivery, and times will vary by manufacturer distributor. Also, demand for equipment and technicians is going to increase exponentially as we approach 2020. Again, allow two to four weeks for scheduling of those certified technicians. And allow one to two weeks installation if you're installing new AFDs or one to four days installation of if you're using retrofit kits or pin pads. And again, I can't stress enough, work with your and consult with your AFD distributor or manufacturer because they'll be able to help guide you through that process. So this is an example of a beta or what we call a field trial. And so if you've determined that your outdoor software is available now, and then we're already towards the end of September, believe it or not, so then you're gonna to wanna to start right away and I use October to assess your field dispenser age and operability, to do your site surveys. Then you're gonna to wanna to collect the data and put together a game plan for each site. And that's when you're gonna to wanna to place your order for field uh, dispensers or your retrofit kits. And then again, then you'll go through the process of installing uh, your field dispensers. And again, these are just exam uh, example of dates and actual timelines will vary. And this is for just your first site out of the chute just to get it in trial and get it working and to, to work out the configuration. Next, I'd like to focus on a sample rollout. So this is gonna be based on a 10 store chain with one store every two weeks because they're gonna be replacing their field dispensers. Again, sort of a, you know, the, the longer case scenario. So beta testing, we typically wanna run it at least four to eight weeks. So re if you recall, that started in April, 2018. Then as, as we roll out EMV, there's going to be some, some little idiosyncrasies 
data element issues that, that were not found in the certification process that really you can find, unfortunately, in the, in the production or the live environment. So, so allow an extra four to 16 weeks to do those POS software fixes and get the, that point of sale updated. Then we're into June. After that, the new rollout can start. And again, we're doing one store every two weeks. So we're gonna start in October of 2018. And then we'll finish that in um, April of 2019. And the reason why it's so far out is you're thinking, well, that doesn't quite add up for, from a math perspective, but really we took into consideration the holidays because a lot of folks don't like to do any um, upgrades between Thanksgiving and New Year's just because it's a very high uh, fuel volume season for us and also for folks that are in uh, colder weather need to account for winter weather. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Linda to talk about the resources. Thanks, Cara. So um, we put together this resource slide. Um, certainly the US Payments Forum and Connexus have some really good information out there. Um, the Petro Working Committee under US Payments Forum is doing a lot of work in this area as, the, as are the Connexus Committees, both the Data Security and Retail Financial Transactions Committee. Um, another good resource are your payment networks website, whether that be MasterCard or Visa or, you know, American Express, Discover, the, the debit networks, et cetera. So look for those websites. Um, we've listed specifically some of the websites um, from both the U.S. Payments Forum. They also have the EMV connection, which has a wealth of information. EMV Co. is more technical. It's the actual standards, but there's a, some good information there the Connexus website as well as the NACS website. And the Petro Working Group under the U.S. Payments Forum recently released their frequently asked questions specifically to Petro, and the link to that is on, you see it there, um, that's a brand new document and it's got some good information to it. So with that, I'd like to turn this back over to Kathy who's going to help us with some Q&A. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Cara and Brian. So we have a few minutes left for questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the limited time we have. Please enter your questions in the questions box. So we did have a few that came in uh, during the presentation. Um, uh, Cara, there were a couple questions related to fraud monitoring and what fraud monitoring services are available from the payment networks and what else, what other tools can be used to um, help deter fraud? Certainly. So start with each payment network themselves because um, most of them offer some sort of a fraud monitoring program and whether you're going to do some sort of a risk evaluation or entering zip code for verification, you know, certainly also your payment processor can also help you from what we call host velocity perspective where you can limit the number of transactions within a certain time period. So all of those things are going to help you reduce your fraud to help uh, keep yourself out of, out of that excessive chargeback threshold. Great. Thanks, Cara. Um, Linda, we had a number of questions on fleet cards. Um, the first one was whether fleet, uh, fleets have to embrace EMV by 2020. Um, and then another question about how encryption is implemented with fleets if it's chipped. Yeah, so to address the first one, the 2020 deadline only goes into effect for those co-branded cards. That that means like if it's a Visa fleet card, for example. The private label fleet cards, are it's up to them whether or not they're going to have a liability shift and whether or not they're going to actually reissue EMV cards. I know that um, a good majority of them are considering it and have a game plan um, in place, but they haven't formally announced um, any liability shift dates or when they're going to start to reissue cards. So if you accept a lot of fleet cards, I would work with your fleet manager to reach out to those cards that you take most often um, to make sure that you have the proper information. In terms of encryption, so it really depends on the encryption standard and the encryption solution that's being implemented and used. Um, Conexus has a point-to-point -point encryption standard that um, specifically accounts for fleet information, prompts, and product restrictions. 
So if you're using an encryption standard that um, builds on the ANSI X9119 Part 1 and then connects the standard builds on top of that, it accounts for some of the fleet information. If you're using an off-the-shelf encryption device, that's where you really have problems because um, some of the encryption solutions don't realize that those middle sensitive digits contain information that we actually need to parse out um, product restrictions and uh, data prompting. So until we come up with the tags and those are released and as part of the cards, um, you're still gonna have problems with encryption. Great, thanks, thanks, Cara. Um, Brian, um, a couple of questions on the, the readers. Um, first is, do all card readers that support EMV accept contactless too? So uh, no, that, that'll be an option that will be available from your vendor. Uh, if you look back at the, the videos that I showed, you can see the, the card reader that the uh, gentleman is using is the contact reader. And I believe it's right above that. There's the contactless top, tap area. Uh, so that would be an option that would be available from each one of your vendors uh, as to whether they would be able to support contactless or not. On the inside pin pads, uh, for the most part, I think the, the pin pads are all capable of the NFC communication, so it would be a matter of whether that's enabled or not, and whether your particular software uh, supports that EMV contactless. Thanks, Brian. There was another question on uh, testing and certification, and there's two parts to it. One is, um, how do you estimate the timing for testing and certification, and maybe that's for Brian and Cara. And then there's also a question on fleet card um, certification in terms of um, how that is being done. So as, as far as testing and certification goes, there's, um, that, that process is, is in flux and has been in flux uh, as a result of work through like the US Payments Forum and Conexus for uh, probably Oh, I don't know, several years now. Uh, so the, the process for doing that is changing continuously. And it's going to vary depending on what type of implementations that you uh, have from your vendor as well. As I mentioned, the, the quick chip certifications have drastically reduced number of test cases. I'm not going to go into the details of exactly why that is here. It's kind of complicated, but um, they have a, a drastically reduced set of test cases, so the certification goes much faster that way. Um, and then uh, outside, uh, we have a, a much larger number of um, kernels that we talk to. So and as we were chatting uh, among ourselves, um, we've kind of had to prioritize our certifications uh, as to who goes first, and, and unfortunately, we can't do them all at once because uh, the requirement um, to do end-to-end -end testing and the amount of manpower that it takes. So we have to pick one at a time and go through. So as a result of our indoor testing, we have a pretty good idea of what it takes to certify uh, a specific uh, card payment uh, network, and that has to be done for each, each card payment, uh, and it has to be done for each kernel. So you just kind of multiply all that stuff out together and come up with a timeline uh, it usually is excruciatingly long <laughs> and painful, uh, but it's getting better. Uh, quick chip's going to help, and we do have a, a fair amount of experience behind us now that we didn't have when we started this, you know, three years ago. So hopefully, uh, outdoor is going to be a little smoother than indoor, even though it's going to be a lot more work. Cara, do you have anything to add in terms of a timeline for testing and certification? Um. Not really, just because of the fact that in the petroleum industry, we're typically relying on the POS vendors and AFD manufacturers, as well as the payment processors to work collaboratively, collaboratively in, on our behalf to do those certifications. Because pretty much everybody in the petroleum industry uses the same base software, and we're, we're, we're almost, for lack of a better term, sharing the same kernels as well. So we really rely on the, our POS vendors and on our vendor partners to help us through that process. Kathy, Thank you. Thing. I'd like I, to add I, that I, um, we have a white paper optimizing transaction time at the point of sale, which has um, a detailed chapter on what is uh, quick chip and M chip fast. Um, how does it differ from 
of standard EMV transaction. So um, I would recommend that you um, take a look at that white paper to get more details and then um, talk with your acquirer. Kathy, also on the on the certification front, um, something else that is, has been happening in the last year or so that is, is going to cut down on the certification times is the, the acquirer's ability to self-certify. So some of the acquirers now are able to certify the EMV without doing full end-to-end -end certification with the issuers, and that's certainly taking uh, a, about a week off of uh, each of our certifications. So that's helping in that regard. Um, another question on uh, the cardholder verification method and whether uh, PIN is going to be required for credit and debit. Um, Brian, do you want to talk about CDMs and sort of what we what we see in the U.S. market? Uh, I, I can talk about what I've seen so far. I, I don't really have any insight as to where it may go in the future, but um, in general, in the U.S. for U.S. issued credit cards, so non-debit cards, uh, the CVMs that I see today are signature CVMs. Uh, so your transaction will run. Uh, more than likely, the card is going to tell the uh, POS equipment at the site to gather a signature. And then something I didn't mention, um, the, the uh, small signature or, or uh, signature limit rules still apply with EMV. So even if an EMV card tells us to gather a signature, we can still look at the uh, the limit, the signature limit value. And if it's under that limit, so $25 or $50, whatever that limit is, we won't be uh, asking the consumer for a signature. So that's how most of the credit is going to work today, to my knowledge. If you're running a debit card, uh, the debit card is more than likely going to pre-select the U.S. Common AID. The U.S. Common AID is going to prompt for an online PIN in most cases. Uh, you'll probably have the option to bypass that PIN if you want. Uh, if you enter the PIN, it's going to go to the issuer as a PIN debit transaction. If you don't enter that PIN, it's going to go uh, on the, as a credit message to the issuer. It's probably still going to run as a debit transaction in a pinless debit or a, a um, signature debit. Uh, but those are the two choices. So if it's a if it's a pure credit card, you're more than likely going to get a signature CVM. If it's a if it's a U.S. issued debit card, you're more than likely going to get an online PIN prompt as a result of the U.S. Common AID pre-selection. Great, thank you. Well, we are at the hour, so we will need to wrap up the um, Q&A period. So if you go to the next slide, please. If you do have follow-up Q&A, if you would like to contact one of the speakers or um, contact me, and I will forward your question, um, we can take care of that after, after the, the webinar. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much for the great questions, and thank you panelists for doing a terrific job of presenting content and answering the questions. For, for further resources, I direct you to the U.S. Payments Forum and connect with websites that are shown on this slide. Both of us have a wealth of resources to help you with your EMV implementation. And we hope that those of you who aren't currently participating in the forum will take a look at us and decide to join our activities. Um, our next member meeting is in December in New Orleans, and we welcome your interest and participation there. Thank you again, and have a great afternoon. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>